Welcome to the Leduc County FCSS and Family Resource Network's Getting Comfortable with Risky Play event featuring Jeff Johnson and in honor of Family Day. My name is Eugenia McGuire and I'm a Family Support and Youth Services Coordinator at Leduc County FCSS, Family and Community Support Services in NISCU. It was nice to see so many parents, teachers and early learning and care and day home providers take an interest in the topic of risky play and sign up for tonight's event. While research is clear on the value of children taking reasonable risks as they play and explore the world, many adults are uncomfortable with such play and exploration. Tonight, Jeff is gonna help us put our minds and emotions at ease by helping us to increase our understanding of risky play's value and how it supports development. I discovered Jeff in 2014 when our ECD coalition in the Leduc County region brought Jeff out to do three presentations in Devon, Beaumont and Leduc. His presentation on messy play was inspiring and forever changed my way of working with young children, but it was his presentation on the benefits of gunplay, wrestling and superheroes that really blew my mind and spoke deeply to my heart. I realized that we'd been missing something as adults and weren't quite understanding all we needed to know about play. Since then, it's been a dream of mine to bring Jeff back to our area to speak to us again about the benefits of risky play. The pandemic has presented a unique opportunity for us to do that online so Jeff can join us from the comfort of his own home in Iowa. If you're unfamiliar with his work, let me tell you a little bit about Jeff. Jeff ran a child care program for over 10 years that focused on child-led play and learning. He has written books for Red Leaf Press that focused on play, relationships, and caregiver self-care. He has been an early learning speaker since 2000 and traveled throughout the United States, Canada, and Australia. Attendees have described his sessions as heartfelt, inspirational, high energy, and humorous. Jeff offers regular live and on-demand sessions via his website, collaborates with other agencies to offer open to the public sessions, and is available for hire as an online trainer. Jeff began podcasting in 2013. In addition to his original show, The Child Care Bar and Grill, he now hosts and produces several early learning focused shows featuring popular early learning authors like Lisa Murphy, who you may know as the Ooey Gooey Lady, Healthy uh, Heather Schumacher, Angela Hanscom, Mike Huber, and Dan Hodgins. There are currently over 1,600 episodes totaling over 700 hours of content available. In 2016, Jeff founded Playvolution HQ, housed at playvolutionhq.com, as, as a home for original and curated early learning content. The site now houses all those podcast episodes as well as thousands of early learning quotes, do-it-yourself projects, articles, and more. Hopefully he'll win you over as he has me and that you enjoy this evening's event. Welcome, Jeff. We're so honored to have you with us tonight. Um, where I, I burnt out and my head exploded and I quit. That's how we found our way to family child care. And, and risky play has been, been part of, uh, you know, my direct care with kids for all of that time, but also it was a big part of my growing up. Um, when we're talking risky play, we're talking risk. Risk is, according to the Cambridge Dic Dictionary, the possibility of something bad happening. And so if you take that definition, and that's their number one definition, everything is a risk, right? Uh, getting out of bed in the morning is a risk because something bad could happen. Stay, staying in bed in the morning is a risk because something bad could happen. So risk is around us all of the time. And one of the reasons that we adults should work at helping the children we work with or live with embrace risk is because risk is a great teacher. There's lots of things we learn. We, we as humans are wired to kind of go a little bit outside our comfort zone and try new things and kind of push our limits. And we're living in a risk adverse world. And so with 24 hour news cycles and social media, all of the bad things in the world that happen get amplified and they, they just kind of work their way into our brains. And we're living in a world, even with COVID going on, that has never been safer for human beings. And yet we, we go through life thinking everything is potentially gonna, gonna hurt us or kill us or, or ruin us in a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot, in a lot of ways. Kids, kids today are, look, we hover as adults because we worry about risk. 
Um, how many of you grew up in a situation where you went outside to play and you were outside with your friends playing and not surrounded by adults? Now, your adults might have been paying attention to you, um, but they weren't hovering the way we hover now. We would go out and there might be a neighbor mowing the lawn or hanging out laundry and that kind of stuff. And th there were adults in the neighborhood keeping an eye on us, but they just weren't right there hovering. One of the biggest things that we could do for children to show them that we trust them a little bit more and are comfortable with them getting a little bit more comfortable with risk themselves is to physically step back a little bit and give them a little bit of space. Um, because it's something that we had and that we valued when we were kids. When it comes to risk, I think maybe we should start thinking about the, the, the word risk a little bit. First, when I'm talking about risk, I'm talking about managed risk, um, child-led risk, developmentally appropriate risk, and caregiver assessed risk. I'm not talking about sending two-year-olds out to play in traffic. That would, that would be that would be beyond risk, that would be hazardous. I'm talking, I, I, I was thinking today about the risky stuff I used to do as a kid running, running around the neighborhood. We would build, we would build ramps. Uh, we would find cinder blocks and pieces of plywood and we would build ramps and we would try to jump our bikes over them and our big wheels, remember big wheels? Um, some of you are too young to remember big wheels. Um, roller skates, we would try to roller skate over ramps. Now maybe the ramp was, I don't know, that high. Um, and yet it was a little bit risky and a little bit dangerous and we loved it. And the parents were watching from the window and did we crash sometimes? Absolutely. Were there were there bumps and bruises? Well, a few. Did we did we all live through it and make it into adulthood? Y yeah. Other things we used to do, we used to climb stuff, and that led to jumping off of stuff. And when we were real young, it was little stuff. I mean, you can you can be a two year old and you can stand in one of those kid sized chairs and leap off of that and think you're Superman flying across uh, uh, Gotham City. Um, we get a little bit older. You want to leap from something a little bit taller. Now, in my in my neighborhood, there was a garage that was kind of built into the side of the hill. One of a hill one of our neighbors had, and so you could actually walk up onto the roof of one side of the garage, but then the other side was like a ten or twelve foot jump, and we worked our way off to jumping off of that off of that 10 12 foot roof because we felt a little bit confident another thing about risk when it comes to children is children are curious about the world but they tend not to be suicidal um they want to have adventures they want to try things but they don't want to get hurt even a very young ages, they become pretty good at assessing danger. And I'm talking most kids most of the time. There's always that child that is going to push you to your limits and challenge, challenge you and, and behave beyond what the norms are. Um, there's research on this. They will, take, they will put, take mobile infants and toddlers and put them on a table that, that is, is designed so it looks like there's an edge, but there's not an edge. You can find video of this on the YouTube. And they will crawl up to that edge, but not crawl over that edge because they don't want to fall. Even, even at less than a year old, they're wired, our brains are wired for self-preservation. And so we need to get a little bit more friendly with the idea that children are very good at assessing risk, especially when they get to practice assessing risk. Now, imagine a child who at the age of, I don't know, one and a half, they're walking and they are prevented from climbing the stairs because it's too dangerous. And that goes on for a long time until they, oh, I don't know, are heading off to university and they end up in a dorm where the elevator is broken and there's this flight of stairs and the only way they can get to their dorm room to get ready for, I'm going to guess they're going to a party and not class, um, is to go upstairs. But in 18 years, they've never been allowed to touch stairs before because it was too dangerous. Um, that a version of that is what we're creating with young people today with our with our risk uh, our, our fear of risk out there in the world.
And so when we can provide children with developmentally appropriate, not necessarily age appropriate, because there's a little bit of a difference there, um, risk, risk that we have assessed and and taking steps to mitigate as much of the danger as possible. I'll, I'll share a link at the end to a, a benefit risk assessment I put together because sometimes doing a, a benefit risk assessment can, can help you wrap your mind around risks because there's a there's a potential danger to the risk, there's potential injury or whatever it is, and then there's the plus side. And we've got to look for opportunities to see both sides of those. And so doing, f completing a, a benefit risk assessment for things can be beneficial. And there's, there's lots out there on the interweb. I like mine best, but there's lots of other tools out there. Um, and, then, and then just paying a little bit of attention to it is, is the, the version of this we're looking for. Now, we always want to pay attention to hazards and dangers and try to mitigate them. We don't want to leave broken broken glass or handguns laying around the playground, for example. Um, but some exposed tree roots that somebody might trip over or a tree that they are free to climb or a slide or a teeter-totter or a swing that they can engage with are all valuable things, although they carry a little bit of potential risk. Oh, by the way, if you have something to say, jump in. I'm going to get to this in a minute. I'm going to ask you about uh, your experience with risk when you were a child and your feelings about it now. So that's something to think about. Um, I want to talk about the types of risk. When we, when we think about risk, we tend to only think about physical risk. That's where our mind goes right away. Physical risk is risks with the body, right? Um, risk that you might break a bone or, or scrape a knee. And that's where, that's where our heads tend to go. But there are three other kinds of risks that we're dealing with in early learning settings, I think, and, and in life in general, that we may not pay so much attention to. So I wanted to spend a moment touching on that. The other one is, is social risk, risks with people. Well, when I was a kid, I was, I was all into the physical risks. But I was a shy kid up through elementary school into, into middle school. I was, I, was, I was a shy kid, and social risk was terrifying for me. And I'm not sure that I had a, enough support or as many opportunities as maybe I needed to practice uh, that risk, to learn how to kind of get over that risk and, and be a little bit more social. But I got into middle school and I started noticing girls and they were awesome and I wanted them to pay attention to me. And so then I had to figure out how to deal with the social risk. We've all, we've all gone through versions of this, right? Um, I, 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 was, I was the kid in, in high school I, I we, in, in English class, we had to get up in front of the in front of the class with our little our little index cards and uh, and do a, like a 30 second presentation in front of the class. I took lower grades in the class because I was too terrified to stand up in front of people and talk. And then somehow it became my job. Um, so those social risks are a big thing for kids. And so that is a kind of risk that there may be certain children in your programs that are they're dealing with and they need support in dealing with that we may gloss over because a lot of the kids that are having problems with social risk are the quiet kids and maybe the well-behaved kids and they just kind of shh behave themselves and don't put themselves out there. And, and so they don't do any social risk taking. And that may be something they need and something that we could support. Another one is emotional risk. Now, maybe my, my fear of public speaking in high school was partly an emotional risk too, because I mean, I was physically terrified. Um, it's, the, it's, the, it's the part of this where we're, where we're risking experiencing or having to deal with feelings, ours and other people's. And this can be, this can be a complicated thing as well and, and not something we pay as much attention to as we do the physical risks. But, but I think in early learning settings especially, this is imp something important to identify because look, anybody feel like they're really, really good at emotions and feelings? I, I don't. I, I don't. Um, uh, most of us don't, and and yet we're 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 humans. We're supposed to be social creatures, and we all have hard times. A lot of us have a hard times with the social side of things. And now imagine being a three-year-old who is feeling emotions and combinations of emotions and feelings for the first time a lot of times, and barely has language enough to identify them. 
And so imagine how risky emotionally it is to be be tossed into a, a new early learning setting, for example, where you don't know anybody and don't have any friends and, and don't feel confident and capable. And so those children end up in a, in, in a space where they need to take emotional risks. And, and that's something that we need to look at supporting and getting comfortable with. And I saw a lot of heads shaking no when I asked who was, who was comfortable with uh, feelings and emotions. And yet we work with little people all day that are just made, they're just bundled of feelings and emotions. And so it's, it's, it's something we need to pay attention to and, and think about. The last one is creative risks. This is risk dealing with ideas. This is having a thought and it becomes risky to share it. And, and look, in the social media world where we're living, we're living in now where you can get canceled for, for having an opinion online, it's, it's terrifying. And imagine being a three-year-old now who is thinking something, but socially feeling uncomfortable voicing it, and, 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 and then having ideas and, and suggestions and thoughts that may or may not go over well. It can, be, it can be a really risky thing to put yourself out there. And so something else we should, we should consider and think about. Um, I'm going to share some quotes later. Um, these four, the, the breakdown of, of these four uh, types of risk come from uh, my buddy Heather Shoemaker. I think it's in her um, It's Okay Not to Share book. It might be her It's Okay to Go Up the Slide book. But I think it really, it really breaks it down a lot and kind of broadens the idea of risk um, a little bit more than, than we, we tend to think about. Um, Thoughts, feelings, opinions about that? If you don't want to talk, you can pop things into the chat too. Make sure I pause for a moment. Okay, well, feel free to jump in anytime because um, it's more fun if I'm not just talking to myself. Let's move on here, and I'm going to really need some feedback here. I need to know... What's your most memorable, memorable risk story from childhood? Anybody have something that they're brave enough to share? I will. Okay, what do you got, Debbie? Uh, I grew up on a farm with six kids, and my dad would take his big tractor inner tube tires and blow them up. And we'd all take turns sitting inside them, and we'd like roll down the hill. And then in the wintertime, we would hook them up to the back of the tractor and, and go for rides. So... I would never let my kids do that now, but I did it growing up. It sounds delightful, and I see a lot of heads nodding, so that must be what everybody in Alberta does during the <laughs> winter. Um, <laughs> and I think it went on plenty here in Iowa because it's kind of the, the, same, uh, the same terrain. Um, so why wouldn't you let the kids do that now? I don't know. It just changed perspective. I was just worried that they were going to break their arm. And my son did break his arm taking the cardboard down the stairs one time. But I think it was more of the, the fear. But my parents didn't have that. They didn't hover. We played on the farm unattended. And I don't know. I don't know what shifted in our generation to make us more of helicopter parents. But um, I see one of my colleagues, Shannon, in here. And she was the one who said to me, like, you just have to step back and let your kids do it. And and let them, let them, because I, I put the fear in them and I didn't want to do that. And I did it. So yeah, and, I'm not uh, yeah. sure why. <laughs> and, and I, I think, I mean, I, I, I did similar things. I mean, we would do a version of that on skateboards behind cars, grabbing a hold of the bumpers of, of, of cars and, and, and hitching rides um, because I wasn't lucky enough to grow up on, on, on a farm, but that's a version of that. And I, I, I think I, I, I I know for a fact my parents liked me and they didn't want they didn't want to have to deal with a broken bone or anything but back then and this was this was the 70s and 80s there there was just it was a world it was a world that was different than the world we're living in and um look kids got hurt but the kid who showed up with a cast on their arm in third grade was like the cool kid because they had a story and everybody got to sign their cast and it was back in the day where we had big heavy plaster casts so there's lots of casts to sign and 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 they became more resilient from this and I'm I'm in no way saying we should go out and break children's arms um but being able to take those risks does 
it builds a little bit of intestinal fortitude and it helps you realize that I, I did this thing and it was scary and I survived. And so maybe I can do another scary thing. And so it, it kind of takes us out of our, out of our, out of our shell. It kind of peels the bubble wrap away from us. Lots of stuff coming in. Uh, we got uh, climbing grain elevators. That sounds kind of dangerous. Um, playing in the sand pit, crossing over the ravine and a fallen tree log to go fishing, playing on the train tracks. I hope the train was a little ways off. Um, you, you're here, so you must have got out of the way. Um, playing hide and seek with uh, within stacked straw bales, playing upstairs in the barn uh, where there were giant holes in the floor. I would jump in the back of the garbage truck or any vehicle that had something that I could hang on to. <laughs> did you? Did was it? Was the garbage truck moving? I, I need to, I, I got to ride a garbage truck once, but um, that's another story. Riding bikes uh, through the neighborhood beaches in Vancouver Island and climbing the sand dunes, all kinds of great stuff. Um, and, and that's probably stuff that's more adventurous than a lot of the stuff that we're, we're keeping kids from doing in early learning settings, right? Um, you know, two-year-olds are, are my go-to for risky things things because a lot of their developmental needs involve risk because they like to they like to climb and they love to run even though they barely know how to work their legs and so there's lots of potential damage two-year-olds could do to themselves and they were built for it two-year-olds are are, are are their bones are basically play-doh i think um not, don't don't quote me on that that's not technically true but i mean their bones are more bendy and less likely to break when they fall and they're they're lower to the ground their center of gravity is different and so two-year-olds are built to fall off of stuff and fall down and yet we try to keep them from doing it and then when they get to be four or five and they're in gym class at school and they're supposed to climb the the ropes course they're terrified because we prevented them from climbing things when they were little and so it's all about letting them do what they're comfortable with when they are when they are tiny and then and letting them build on that and find out what their thing is. A, a kid may climb when they're real little and realize, hey, this isn't for me. And then they're not climbers anymore. Um, I want you to pay attention to those stories and maybe spend some more time thinking about your stories of childhood and your personal risk-taking experiences because in your program, when it comes to talking to parents and coworkers about risk, those stories can come in handy. I think we, we, we're wired with these 10,000-year-old hunter-gatherer brains where we like to sit around the campfire and tell stories of our, of our adventures. And I think those can be illuminating for, for especially a lot of parents of maybe younger children. Now, the problem we're having is a generational one because I think there are a lot of young parents now who don't have stories of risk in their in their lives. And so we're almost we're we're at a we're at a point where the children aren't taking risks because their parents never took risks. And to me, that's, that's kind of terrifying because getting through to them and helping them see the value of this is, is a lot more difficult. Um, and I'm also guessing they're, those are the people who most need to do something like this and talk about this topic. And they're the ones that are probably the less likely to show up. Um, I'm guessing some of you are here because you, you're pretty cool with risk and would like to do more of it. You just need to, to figure out how to convince the other people of it. Um, and so that's a, that's a piece of this as well. And so I think these stories can, can be valuable when it comes to that. Anybody have, else have an awesome story from childhood they want to share? We had a lot of them in the chat. The next one I want to throw out there, next question is, what's your relationship with risk now? Hi, Jeff. It's Shannon. I, I'm a firm believer in risk, and I'm always willing to try anything once. Anything? Well, within reason, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> as far as risk goes and jumping or climbing or whatever, I will try anything once, and then we'll see how many injuries I get, and then I'll determine if I do it again. Hey, so Shannon, of those four types of risks that I that I mentioned earlier, which one are you least comfortable with? Uh, 
I'm not sure. That's a good honest answer. Um, and, and I think as adults, we kind of lock in on on, on on one of those that, that maybe is the thing that we're least comfortable with. Um, you know, we, we took a lot of risks or we played sports and we were adventurous as kids and we may stay that way when we get older or we were shy as kids and we stay that way when we get older. And so the, the social or the emotional risks are harder for us. And, and, and I, I think one of the valuable reasons for, for thinking about which one of those are you're least comfortable with is that kind of impacts how we deal with kids, right? If you are physically, if, if you're adverse to physical risks yourself, it makes it a little bit more challenging to support the three and four year olds who are into physical risks. And if you are, if you're kind of all into that kind of thing, but you have a little bit, a little bit of problem with uh, the social or the emotional risks, may, then maybe it's a little bit harder to be supportive of the kids who are, who are into those kind of risks because you're not. And so just being a little bit more aware of, of, of where you are with those four just personally can kind of be, be valuable. And um, just kind of knowing what your relationship with risk is now is, is it, 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 it informs where your interactions with care, with, with kids in your care are going to go. I got to tell you, I just turned 52 and, and about a year ago, I started worrying about, uh, you know, winter and I've, I've got two good sized dogs and I like to go out and, you know, it, we don't have like Alberta winters, but we have winter here in Iowa. I mean, we have snow and it's cold out, but I mean, not Alberta cold, but cold. And, and I, 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 I start thinking, huh, are these dogs going to see a wild turkey and go after it and yank on the leash? And then I'm going to fall down and break a hip. Um, nothing until I turned 51, it never popped into my head, but now I'm thinking, uh, uh, maybe on real icy days, maybe I need to just walk one dog at a time. Uh, that's, that's kind of the risk assessment that I was talking about a couple of minutes ago. We do that. We do that in our own lives. And so pay attention to, to what your relationship with risk is now. And it might be something to, to talk to coworkers about if you're looking at building a more risk-friendly uh, program uh, for the kids that you, you work with. Another one I wanna throw out there is what roadblocks make supporting children's risk-taking challenging in your, in your program? I know a lot of you are, are running your own programs or, or home-based, some of you are in centers. Um, what roadblocks are out there that you're dealing with? And you can, you can either unmute yourself and share those or pop them into the chat because I think, I think you know, figuring out ways over or, or under or around those roadblocks are, are one of the biggest challenges that we have. I think a lot of times it's Hunter. I think a lot of times it's, it's parents. It's the difference in parents and the difference in the way they, they feel that their children should be taking part in programming. So that's where we, that's where our challenge of risk kind of comes to the big blocks in our program. Yeah. Yeah. Any, anybody agree with that one? I sure do. And so back in my program directing days, um, we, because we knew this was an important thing, we made it a, a big part of our onboarding process when we were enrolling families, we made sure we had a, a statement in our, in our parent handbook that, hey, we take risks here and here's why. It, it, builds, it builds confidence, it builds bodies, um, it, it builds self-esteem, it, build, it helps with self-regulation skills, all, all that stuff. Um, so that parents were really, really clear about it. And then, and then as we were orienting them, we would, we would talk about it more and, and, and show them around the program and give them examples of what that, what that looked like. And, and that becomes real valuable because you will, as much as possible, when you have the parents on the same page, it's a lot easier to go about your day. And so if you're looking at, at becoming more risk friendly, one of the things that you need to do is bring parents along and so having those conversations and revising those policies and bringing everybody up to speed is, is, is a big step in this. And, and there are going to be parents that are going to push back a little bit. And I mean, some of them, it's possible to, to educate them and bring them along. And, and others, I mean, we, we had some families that we didn't either didn't enroll 
um, or ended up kicking out of the program at a later date because they they didn't fit the program that we we ran. Um, they gave good interview and they're like, oh yeah, we're all for that. And then they got into it and like, oh no, this doesn't this doesn't work for us. And our thing was, well, if it doesn't work for you, then here's a list of some other programs that might be a better fit for you. Um, there, there are a lot of, poor, of of parents that are looking for a program, and they'll they'll say whatever they need to say to to be able to drop the kid off the first day. And we all we all know that that's a thing. And and we want to be as supportive um, of families as we can and nurture them along. And every once in a while, there's there's not that goodness of fit, and it it needs to be. Um, I mean, you, you can't just lock the door on them and, and, and tell them you never want to see them again. Uh, uh, kind of helping them, helping them find some place that would be a better fit is probably the, 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 a good way to go about it. But, but sometimes that, that fit isn't there. But I think the educating the parents is, is a big piece of this. And again, talking, talking about those experiences and, um, and the benefits and, and reading up yourself on risk. At the end, I'm going to pop some, uh, some links into the chat. One is the uh, um, benefit risk assessment I told you about. Another is uh, a link to a collection of risky play articles I've collected on the the Playvolution HQ site that I run that were mentioned at the beginning of the session, and I think there's 40 or 50 different articles there um, that that dig into this topic, and 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 some of them are research based, and some of them are op ed type things from from parents who kind of embraced risk, and so there's a lot of good stuff there, and some of that stuff might be worth um, sharing with parents either online or or as printouts in 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 program newsletters or that kind of thing because it just gets them thinking about them about those topics and and uh, allowing to have conversations one roadblock might be all the accident reports we need to do and then this is a subsequent follow-up that goes along with that um yeah okay i i totally agree and and so here's my recommendation I think we need to we need to of course follow whatever your provincial guidelines are for reporting of that kind of stuff and do as much as we can to turn down the burner under those things so that they don't become big panicky things. Um, I would almost uh, one thing I, I, I counsel programs to do when when the local regulations allow it is to have different levels of incident reports. Um, if somebody, for example, if somebody falls down and they, they, they get a scratch on their elbow and you need the parent to know about it because, you know, it, their kid was bleeding for about eight seconds. Um, it's just a little, little half sheet kind of thing that here's what happened and here's what we did about it. If it's something bigger, like a blow to the head, which could actually be a big thing, then you have the full, the full fledged incident report. Um, the smaller one is mostly about notifying them. And making them aware that hey, there's a scratch on her on her elbow because she was climbing the tree and 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 she scratched herself on a on a on a, a little twig on her way down um, is is a whole different incident than than somebody falling out of the tree and landing on their head. And so the paperwork that we we have to deal with that should be different. And I I don't know exactly what the what the rules are in in uh, the province, but when that can be done, that that should be talked about. And I think those 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 incidents Incident reports should also be a conversation when you're enrolling families. If you can't do the kind of the, this isn't so bad incident report versus the eek incident report, having a conversation at the beginning with families is, okay, every time this child scrapes their head or, or is bitten by a gnat when we're outside playing or gets a mosquito bite, I have to fill out this three-page form. Um, it doesn't mean your child's at risk. It just means the province wants me to do a lot of paperwork and I got to do it. Um, chill out though about it. If it's a real serious thing, I'll call you at work. Um, if you're getting this handed to you at the end of the day, it's not such a big deal and we can talk about it and we're doing everything we can to keep your child safe. And if something bad does happen, we're trained to take care of it. But just because we get to an incident report report at the end of the day doesn't mean you need to panic about it. And having something, some conversations like that with parents at the beginning of, uh, of your relationship with them when you're bringing into the program. And then, and then following through with little conversations about that as, uh, as, as time goes by can be, can be really valuable. Because, because look, all of them have to deal with paperwork and stuff in their jobs as well. And they, they probably, most of them totally get 
that it's something you have to do and something that that they may not need to be as amped up about as they thought they did. Um, does that make sense? Um, we, I mean, we had we had really good experience with it, and it and it seemed to it seemed to seem to be helpful for for programs and 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 programs uh, since them subsequently that I've talked to that have that have used the idea have have, have found it to be beneficial. It just kind of turns down the 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 flame underneath uh, a lot of the fear. And, and I think so another part of the parent is just the fear. Parents want the best for their children, except have a really hard time knowing what that looks like because we're living in a world where they might be living half a continent away from their family and they don't have a lot of local friends that have parenting experience and they're trying to do the best and, and they see lots of scary stuff on the internet. And so you become their resource for a lot of information about this. And so just being able to, to feed those risk, those, those parents who are amped up on the risk, um, little bits of information about, hey, the world really is this bad. And her falling down on the playground because she tripped over the roots under the tree isn't, isn't such a bad thing. And in fact, it might, it might help her deal with things when, when she gets a little bit older, because you know, if she can fall down and scrape her knee, and live through it, she's going to build a little bit of confidence. And when she gets a little bit older and gets a bad grade on a test, she's going to be a little bit more resilient and able to do that. And after she falls down and scrapes her knees a couple times and gets a couple bad grades on a test, when she's a little bit older and somebody breaks her heart for the first time, she's going to be a little bit resilient and be able to, to, to live through that. Um, we're living... We're living in a world where there are a lot of young adults out there because they were kept away from all of the risk, the physical risk, the social, the emotional, the, the creative risk, that when the world throws a curveball at them, they, they struggle to deal with it. Any, anybody besides me know those young adults? I've, I've, I, I, I know a few too many of them. Um, and sometimes I feel like I am one sometimes too. So it's not like I've got it all figured out. And so anything we can do to help help uh, build this uh, this resilience, this this uh, I like the word grit because that's kind of that's kind of what it is. It's a little bit of of uh, intestinal fortitude. I can I can manage that. And that's one of the one of the big things that comes from a little bit of of risk taking. So that's what those are. Oh, I got one more here. Um, well, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. We got to push. I got to push the clicker the right direction. And so, what I want to do now is another thing I've got in that Play Evolution HQ site is about seven going on eight years ago. I started putting a posting a a new early learning quote to uh, my Facebook uh, page every day. And so now there's like over three thousand of them out there, I think. And so I, I went through and I I picked some out um, for um. That, that were related to risk. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time on those. Also, at the end, I'm gonna click a link into the chat that goes to all of the quotes I'm gonna share, plus some more. Um, and if you go to that link, you, you'll wanna use the password risk to get into that one, because I've, I've got it just for people that, that, do, that do this session. Um, and of that group, there are still more out there in the wild um, on that site that, that I didn't even have time to get there. Um, I think there were like four or 500 that were somehow risk related. Um, so we, don't, we didn't have time for all of those. But this one, this one is by my, uh, my buddy, Dan Hodgins, who does a lot of training. I know he's been up in the Edmonton area a number of times before um, from his book, um, Boys Change the Classroom, Not the Child. You cannot learn to be safe by avoiding risk. Risk provides an avenue for practicing skills involved in making wise choices. And so all of those risks, whether it's social, emotional, or physical, um, you're, you're making choices and you're living with the consequences of those choices. And that makes you a better assessor of risk. It makes you a better decision maker. And it makes you a better planner of what you're going to do in the future. Um, I, I talked earlier we, about how when we were kids, we spent a lot of time building ramps and trying to jump things with wheels over them. And a lot of times the ramps fell down. And a lot of times we crashed. And then we would reassess things and figure out how to build the ramp better or how to approach it at a different angle or maybe put it in a safer place. So we were, if we did fall, we, we fell onto grass instead of concrete, all those kind of things. And so, so risk helps you assess 
future potential risks and make better decisions as we move forward. Um, Dan is Dan is great, and uh, and and that book. If you if you work. Um, um, with with well, look, it's called Boys Change the Classroom, Not the Child, but it's it it, it could be called of uh, Children Change the Classroom, Not the Child. It's a it's a great book, and uh, he's got another one out uh, called um, um, Get Over It, um, and it's basically about hey, kind of get over your stuff and do what needs to be done with kids, and and both of those are great um, if you're looking for some reading material. Another one I wanted to throw up at you from Heather Shoemaker, who I mentioned earlier. Taking risk develops the frontal lobe of the brain. That's the same area needed for executive functions, including concentration, memory, flexibility, and problem solving. And so risk taking makes us better thinkers. And again, not just this, not just the physical risk, but all, all those other risks as well. They, 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 it, it develops that part of the brain where all those important things are going on. And when we talk about kids being school ready, the big thing teachers are concerned about um, is, is that executive function part, right? Um, can this child manage themselves uh, which allows them to be be in a group with with other children, and so that risk taking in those early years is is actually actually school readiness uh, preparation in a lot of ways when you when you think about it. That's also a a, a great book, and the the podcast I did with uh, Heather it's called uh, Renegade Rules, named after her books, and uh, and risk is a topic we got into sometimes there, and so um, those episodes might be might be useful resources um, if you want to kind of bring others up to speed on this kind of thing. Uh, another one here, this is another, oh, I went the wrong way again. I got to click the right direction. This is from Mike Huber. His, he's got a book out. It's right there, Embracing Rough and Tumble Play. And, and uh, he had a podcast called um, Teaching with the Body in Mind. And they talked about a lot of big body stuff. Uh, the real risk is that children won't explore or challenge themselves. If they know how to self-assess and minimize risk, they can be lifelong explorers, confident in their own, confident in their own abilities. And so, yeah, when, like I talked about with the ramps, when you, when you fall down or you, you, the thing you try doesn't work, will you take a, will you take a creative risk? Uh, maybe you're building something in the block area that doesn't turn out the way you wanted to. It allows you to self-assess and go back and, and kind of minimize the risk the next time you do the thing. Lots of value in, in, in that. Another one is another one from Heather from another one of her books. I think this is a different book. Driving a child to the grocery store, school, or grandma's house certainly doesn't seem like a dangerous activity, but chances are it's the worst risk you, experience, you expose your child to every day. Car crashes are the leading cause of death and serious injury for children. And so here's the thing. We worry about risk, but a lot of times we don't worry about the right ones. Um, if, a, if a child is going to be hurt, it's very likely it's going to be in a vehicle. And yet, how many people drive vehicles with their children? Well, their text, 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 blah, blah, blah. it's just lemonade I'm drinking, I promise. Um, well, they're texting. Um, the parents, and, and this might be a good conversation to have with parents that are worried about the child climbing the tree or, or going down their slide on their belly or things like that. Um, talk to them about their driving habits. Um, and I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to call them out or cast any shade on them. But when you see them backing out of the, the driveway for your program, while their cell phone is in front of their face. And five minutes ago, they were yelling at you about how risky your program is for their kids. It, it might be worth a conversation about, about what the statistics say about real risk. Um, things like, uh, you know, we, we, what swimming pools are, are another, another big harmer of real life human children. Um, if children are really going to be physically hurt, it's more likely to be in a accident at home than it is going to be in an accident at childcare. That's just what the statistics are. Um, at least here in the States, I, I'm, and I'm guessing it's, it's fairly similar, uh, um, in, in the Canada. Um, an, another one, uh, we worry about stranger danger, right? That we terrified a stranger danger. If a child is going to be abducted or physically or sexually abused by a, 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 an adult, it's more likely that it's going to be a family member or somebody that they know than by a total stranger. 
a, a lost child is is statistically safer with a total stranger than than they are with 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 a family member or or somebody they know, um, which is. I mean, that makes me think all kinds of bad things about the world in and of itself, but that's just that's just the way the numbers are. Um, children, we talk about, oh, kids can't play outside anymore because child abduction. Well, child abduction numbers are, are way down, at least here in the States, um, compared to what they were in the 60s and 70s and 80s. It's actually safer for kids to be outside playing now than it was when when I and some of you were growing up. And so really knowing what the numbers are about these kind of things can, can kind of help us make a little bit more informed decisions. Uh, so I'm not saying that, you know, you need to just, you, you need to have, uh, have all your programming based on actuary tables, um, but, but being aware that, uh, that, that, that that information is out there is, is, is valuable. One other one, I, just, I was just thinking about this earlier today, um, risk sometimes is, is cultural and geographic. Uh, you guys are going to love this one, I hope. Uh, a bunch of years ago, I was down in Florida, and we were visiting some programs. And we're at this one early learning program, and they decided it was too risky to go outside that day because it was um, about 17 Celsius. Too cold. Um, they, they were worried the kids would, would get the sniffles and it was, was going to be bad for their health for them to go out in, in, on a day that half of you are walking around stripped down to your shorts and you got your flip-flops on, right? Um, <laughs> and it's literally, it's literally that much below zero up there now, I'm sure. Um, and so it, it, so it can be cultural. And, and yet, um, the, the cultural thoughts on risk in the middle of Edmonton are probably a little bit different than on the shores of, uh, of Clearwater Beach, Florida, when it comes to uh, to shore safety and and uh, and the things you stumble uh, stumble along when you're walking along the ocean. Just because there's not a lot of ocean in in Alberta, from I mean, unless you go to the the mall, of course, in Edmonton, you got a little bit of ocean there. But um, beyond that, um, there's not a lot of a lot not not a lot of ocean shore to deal with. And so, risk can be cultural and and kind of geographic too when we when we start pulling back and thinking about it. Um, and so, so maybe doing kind of an assessment of our, what are we what are we considering risky that isn't risky in other parts of the world it might be a, a, a fun way to to kind of look at the way you're approaching some things. Another one of these quotes from a book called I'm OK by a guy named Jared Green, children will always find risks, risks to take. So make sure there are risks available that meet children's needs in a context you feel is safe. Find ways for them to experience the sensation of height and velocity and impact that don't risk permanent damage. And so I, I, I did a session the other night about uh, uh, early childhood uh, play schema, and it's just basically kids have these kind of things that they like to do while they're exploring the world, and 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 so there's there's this thing that uh, kids will go through a stage. A lot of kids will go through a stage where they like to throw things, or run real fast and crash into things, or leap off of things, and so since we know most kids are going to want to do these things. Our job becomes creating a safe, managed, assessed way for them to do them um, instead of having them figuring out their own ways to doing them. You may, they, they may want to climb in the toddler room, for example, and you're within your rights to not want them to climb up the bookcase. And you do need to find something for them to climb on because they're going to climb no matter what. And so your job becomes, if they, I don't want them to climb there, where can they climb? And that's what, really what Jared is talking about here. Take those things that they're, they're, going, to, they're going to do these things anyway. We can't stop them. Um, what can we do to make it safer? What can we do to make the parents more comfortable with this? What can we do to make it less likely that we're going to have to fill out that incident report? Um, because nobody wants to do any more paperwork. Um, that's a, that's a, it's a, well, all of these, I wouldn't be sharing them if they weren't good books. So I don't need to say this is a good book. Another one, 
is uh, from Mike Huber again. Problems arise when children do not get enough experience assessing risk because the adults around them minimize risk for them. If parents always dress their children, the children do not learn how to dress themselves. The same is true of risk assessment. If parents, if the adults are always assessing the risk, the child never learns how to assess the risk. And so one of the benefits of taking risks is you learn how to assess risks. Um, and I mean, it can, as an adult, it can be really hard letting your, your, your kid take a risk. Um, and it's something that it's something that literally we have to practice at. I, I was thinking about this today. When my daughter was little, we would go to the playground and she would try to keep up with her big brother, who was about two years older than her, and all the other older kids on the playground. And so that would mean she'd be climbing things and 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 doing things that that were maybe a little bit beyond her reach. I mean, sometimes almost physically beyond her reach. And I remember sitting at the playground one day and she's up on up on like the seventh level, second level of a play structure. Right. And uh, I don't know, maybe six, eight foot off the ground and it's got one of the slidey down like a fire pole slide down pole but you got to reach out and grab it and wrap your legs around it and slide down and she must that she was under two at the time and she's standing there and she stands at the edge looking at this pole I, I mean in my head it seemed like 45 minutes right but it was probably 20 seconds and she's seeing the bigger kids sliding down this pole then run up and slide down the pole again and she leans out and I'm terrified, right? Oh, I'm going to, because I'm there with the kids by myself at the park. And if, if I bring her back broken, I'm going to be in so much trouble with my wife. It's going to be horrible. And, and then she leans out and she gets the pole. I'm like, yeah, my girl. And then the legs go around and she's wearing a, a dress, which actually helps with the sliding down. And she slides down and her face lights up. And I get this look like, see what I did? And I'm like, yeah, you did it, my girl. And then she's up there and she does it again. And this time, instead of waiting for 20 seconds, it's about 10 seconds. And then the next time, it's about five seconds. And the next time, she's barely pausing when she gets to the end of the platform. And I was terrified. Um, I was terrified until she'd done it like 100 times. Then I started feeling a little bit more comfortable with it. And then what got me thinking about this is I was thinking about the same thing with my granddaughter at the same playground. Because when the granddaughter, daughter of the, I mean, daughter of the daughter was doing this years later, I was kind of, I, I barely looked up from my book. Um, that's how, <laughs> does that make me a bad papa? Um, because I mean, I, I'm like, yeah, you, you're much more adventurous and skilled than your mom was and she managed it, you're cool. Um, so over time, we do build up a little bit more comfortable with risk taking and and I was I was I did look up from the book I was watching I, I um, but um, we do get a little bit more comfortable but it does take practice to kind of kind of turn down that flame of fear we have under things. Another one I got up here again from Jared Green is risk is the possibility that something bad will happen. Like I said at the beginning in that quote, but he goes on as well as the possibility that something good will happen. And it's a crucial part of learning. And so a lot of times when we think about risk, we only think about that something bad could happen part. We need to remember that that second clause of, of the quote here, something good could happen too. And that's what the benefit risk assessment is all about. It's about listing, here's the benefits of this thing, climbing, running, whatever it is, um, and here are the risks. And then down here, here are the things that we're going to do to, to kind of lessen the chance that those risky parts are going to happen while we support the benefit parts. And so if, if, if benefit risk assessment isn't, isn't something you've done much of, this can be a real good tool. And this can be a good tool for, for bringing parents along as well, because it shows that you put some thought into the thing you're trying to, to let the kids do and, uh, and lets them see that there's, there's, um, there's, there's the, they, it helps the parents see the benefit side of things, which they, they may have missed because their mind is on the, on the scary side. Another one we've got here is um, from Sarah Knight, a risk and adventure. Sounds like a great tale. Risk and adventure in early years outdoor play. Um, without opportunities to challenge themselves, 
children's understanding of safety will not move forward. So instead of saying no to risk, try saying, okay, how can I do this happily? It's about how can, how can we support this thing? How can we make it safe enough? How can we make it safer? How can we mitigate those risks? Um, because, because it does allow for that forward motion. I mean, if we're <laughs> learning to walk, is a very, I mean, that's a very risky thing. You're this, you're this little creature with this big head, um, with these weak, squirrely little legs, and you spend a lot of time working your abs, bouncing up and down when you were little, and and twisting and turning, and then you're going to pull yourself up and take steps. My gosh, you're built to fall over when you're doing that, and yet, and 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 yet, kids do it, and they've been doing it for well, I mean, as long as we've been human. And if you look, you can go online and you can find safety gear for children who are learning to walk. You can find helmets and elbow and knee pads for crawlers um, because that's how scared we are of risk. Um, back in our family child care days, uh, a little girl, her name was Sida, and her dad used to joke that um, she had a bruise on her forehead that seemed to move around her forehead. Um, it, I mean, it was really a series of different bruises, but he, he likened it to that, that big storm on, on the planet Jupiter that, that, that we see on, on, on the pictures, and it would just kind of move across her forehead, and, and then she, she got older and the bruise went away, but I mean, she had a big, she had, a, she had an exceptionally big head. Um, she's a teenager now, I wonder if she grew into her head. Um, anyway, I'll have to, <laughs> have to email them and find out. Um, another one from Carol Garhart, Garhart Mooney from Swinging Pendulums. How much risk is too much? How high is too high? If we are too cautious, do we inhibit natural growth and development? How are children, how can children conquer fear of height if no one lets them try? And, 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 and this differs from child to child. Um, I remember visiting a forest school in, uh, in New Brunswick, um, Tiernanog Forest School. It's, it's a delightful place. And, and um, we, we walk into the forest school area and I hear this voice from above and I look up and there's this mm, five or six year old, probably 25 foot up in the tree just sitting on a branch and it's, it's a November day. It's probably just above freezing. And you can, I mean, you can visually see the tree moving back and forth. And he's just sitting there with this huge grin on his face. He came down and introduced himself later that morning. Uh, it was snack time. We were going to have tea and uh, the kids were making um, apple crisp with ground fall apples. They just connected. And this kid, this kid that had been 20, 25 foot up in the tree takes out a knife and a flint and starts the fire at forest school by himself. I mean, he, he gets all the kindling in there, pfft, uh, takes him a couple strikes and, and it sparks and he's got this fire going and then he nurtures that fire along while all the other kids are, are taking their places around the fire to help with the cooking. Kids are incredibly curious, incredibly um, um, capable and, and they're, they, they don't want to get hurt and they're pretty darn good at assessing risks when we trust them to do it. And of course, it's a skill, like I said before. It, 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 we have to build the skill of letting them try things, but over time, they build the skill of, of becoming better risk takers. They, they become better at trying things. I think this is the last one. Uh, the most valuable, indeed essential asset the student brings to any learning task is a willingness to adventure, to take risks. Without that, he can't learn anything. The teacher must not kill the spirit, but honor and strengthen it. Strengthen it. Um, and so all learning involves risk because you have to open yourself up to something that you don't know, something that you, you, and you have to admit, you know, this is a thing I don't know. I'm going to learn this thing. And that, that's it. That's an emotional social risk. Every time we learn something new and it's a, it's a huge part of, of uh, growing and learning. And I ran into a lot of adults who had risk adverse early childhoods and they kind of shut themselves off as adults from learning new things and taking in new information because it's it's too too socially or emotionally scary for them to to have thoughts in different directions or they don't they they they, they want to learn a new skill whether it's it's knitting or 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 skiing and it becomes too scary because it involves physical stuff they're not comfortable with 
And so I guess the willingness to put yourself out there and be a little bit more comfortable with with taking these uh, these 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 um, these invitations to learning new things, which is what risks are, and and running with them is an important thing. Knowing your own stories and your own experiences and your own feelings about risk can can help you move in a direction of being a little bit more comfortable with it. Um, I really don't know how to end the session. Um, so I'm just gonna say any final questions or thoughts before we wrap up? Will I start posting things into the chat? Well, I'll jump in here and then if any of um, if anyone else wants to unmute and ask any questions or just type those into the chat, um, we can do that immediately after. Um, but Jeff, I'm willing to send any resources you have out to all of those who've registered. So um, all these oh. um, links that you're putting in the chat, I will make sure to send those out uh, by email tomorrow. Excellent. Um, I'm also going to jump in here with a poll. Um, I will send a survey by email as well. Um, that will give you an opportunity to offer a little bit more extensive feedback. Um, but we really, really need these particular outcomes data, um, this outcomes data. So if, if everyone could um, just complete that poll, that would be most wonderful. Well, I have you as a captive audience. Um, and Jeff, as you were talking, I just want to offer this. I I, can't, I came up with three different memes for new memes for your collections. <laughs> I know oh. you love memes. Uh, one of them is a direct quote from you, um, in spite of you asking not to be quoted. Uh, I thought it would be thought it was great. It's their bones are basically Play-Doh, and it's read to you. <laughs> <laughs> the other one, um, I just kind of captured your thought. Um, I, and I wrote, it's risky to deprive a child of the opportunity to assess risk, which I think is, you know, that's the real risk. It's actually risky to uh, deprive a child of the opportunity to assess risk. Yeah. And then the last one um, is just for fun. Uh, don't let the wild turkeys get in the way of your play. <laughs> well, you might break a hip. <laughs> I've also found that wild turkeys and wild turkey are uh, are delightful together. They kind of go good. Together. That's a that's a that's a bourbon and uh, stay. anyway. Oh, um, okay, okay. That's part of the the childcare bar and grill part of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, uh, Lisa and I don't drink a lot. We used to drink a lot when we recorded that show. We don't anymore. Um, I put those links in. If remember, if you go to the quote one, that's got a password on it, and the password is risk. If you wanna if you wanna grab those, and. Um, if there's anything I can do as follow up, because I know I threw a lot of a lot of stuff at you, uh, all you got to do is email me. I love talking about this stuff, and there might be stuff you're dealing with specifically um, that you want to talk about and work through, or, or need some thoughts or resources on. Just just reach out and let me know, because that's kind of the job. Is there anyone else who has any wants to jump in with any final thoughts or questions before we wrap up? Interesting um, that you guys said that, well, I mean, that you mentioned that they are incredibly capable um, because we were, I was doing an art class a little while ago that was interspaced with physical theater. And I said to the kids, you are incredibly capable of doing this. And one of the kids said, you are incredibly capable of teaching us this. Aww. And I said, okay, well, I'm incredibly capable. Then we're all incredibly, we're gonna do it as a team. Um, but I think we also, as, as the, it, it kind of hit me because I think that as teachers and as parents and as, as guiders, um, we need to remember that we are also capable of taking risks and we are also able to, to put ourselves out there a little bit more than we do. And so anyway, I just wanted to share that. I thought that was, that was a lovely thing to remember. It's also a nice thing to hear from those little people, huh? <laughs> yeah, 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 it was great. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. And I hope well, we don't have to wait another seven years to bring you back. Maybe um, well, I'm always community. here on the internet. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> but may, it'd be nice to see you in person at some point once COVID uh, blows over. But I know you like doing things and you have a great studio. So that this totally works. Um, I'm so well, glad you got being invited. Yeah, I'm so glad you got past your shy kids social risk and you don't need your index cards anymore. And <laughs> It was a very powerful 
evening that really helped to put things into perspective. And I, I definitely, I know I was thinking of it mostly in terms of physical risk. So to have you expand that and just help me to, to realize and remember that this is, you know, encounters with futilities are the heart of resilience and um, yeah, like there's just so many different forms of risk and this is so important for, for kids development. So thank you so much. And there's a couple other comments in the chat. Um, when will the presentation be available? So I did, I have been recording this and so I'll share that as well. Unfortunately, when I hit record at the very beginning, um, I didn't follow through and, and click the, where do I want this file to go <laughs> button. And so I missed recording my introduction and like maybe the first couple few seconds there um, of you speaking, Jeff. So that's unfortunate, but uh, I got the bulk of it. So uh, basically right in the beginning. So. Um, again, thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, that was an amazing, inspiring hour. Well, thank you all for the hard work you do. It's, I mean, in the world we're living in, it makes it makes a hard job even harder, I'm sure. And I, I don't know if I'd be able to survive it if I was still in the classroom. So thanks for all the hard work. Yeah, and any, any additional resources, like if you want to send me anything in the next, um, you know, day, I will uh, include that uh, in the resource list that I send out to everyone. So Excellent. Thank Thanks, you everybody. all so much for coming. Uh, stay warm. <laughs> Thank you for coming. And um, I'll share resources in the recording with you. Take care. Thank you again, Jeff. Great to see you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.